inspire. Welcome back to Starting Now. I'm Jeff Saris. Today I'm talking to the beloved game designer Jamie Stegmeyer of Stonemeyer Games. Jamie has produced some of the most successful board games of all time. He's currently out of the, say, top 100,000 games that are listed on Board Game Geek. Maybe I shouldn't say top, but there are quite a few games on there. He has the 11th, 20th, and 21st most popular games of all time. He's a prolific designer, a wonderful guy, and I'm really excited to to have this conversation, to share it with you. As you may notice, this is a new intro from what we've been doing normally. I'm changing it up, just just like the premise of the show starting now. I, I dove right in, I started this podcast, and now I, it's time to uh, give a little little adjustment to fit more the tone and the vibe that I'm going for. And you'll also find in this episode that we run into a, a little snafu about halfway through where uh, my hard drive filled up with storage. But you know what? I'm leaving it in because that's just how this goes. We're trying to show the process, trying to teach you how to get started on, on your next big idea. So without further ado, here's my conversation with Jamie Stegmeyer. Thank you so much, Jamie, for being on the show. I'm really excited yeah. to share your story and and dive into your entrepreneurial journey. Awesome. Yeah, me too. Yeah. So um, originally, this is called Starting Now. It's a show about change, resilience, and your next big idea. Um, originally, I considered calling it the business of because I'm really fascinated about different industries and how um, you're in the board game industry and you've you've really created some great some really highly revered games i mean they're phenomenal games but some of the uh greatest of all time really it's it's i mean i know you probably won't say it that way but it's they're <laughs> they're rated so highly because they are they're very they're excellent and but you you've found a way to balance you balance the the design side for game design and whatnot but then also you are an entrepreneur you're um a founder of a company tell us a little bit about um Stonemeyer and how you got started. Yeah, um, I, I consider the the exact inception point for Stonemeyer, or at least the point where we became a company, um, was uh, was back in 2012 when I had uh, designed a game, Viticulture, specifically to launch it on Kickstarter because I was really excited about game design, something I had done my whole life as a hobby, and I was really also excited about the concept of Kickstarter, the the idea that I could connect individually with a bunch of different people who shared my passion for a specific game in this case. And so the, uh, I didn't know if it would fund. I, I didn't know if we actually would have a company or if anything would come of it. But fortunately, after I think it was around, took around two weeks on Kickstarter and it did then successfully fund. And that's the moment that I consider that, uh, that Stonemaier Games officially began. And then since then, yeah. we've, we've grown quite a bit in terms of number of things printed. Um, but, uh, but we've we're also, as you've alluded to, we've remained very small as a company. I say we... Because I have a co-founder, and I also now have a, another full-time coworker. But for a long time, for seven years, I was the only full-time employee here. Yeah, that's amazing. And to grow like you have and staying so tiny is it's it's impressive. That's why I wanted to dive into this talk. Um, yeah. When you when you found your co-founder, was this someone who you were already friends with? Did you seek complementary skills? How did you approach that? Yeah, it was uh, during the playtesting process for Viticulture, the local playtesting process, when I was just making prototypes, cutting them out and uh, sharing them with friends. I was looking for people to playtest. And I kind of felt bad every time I asked someone to playtest it because the game wasn't very good at all. And mm -hmm. that's the process I go through for, for any game. But so I would ask one friend to playtest and then another friend. And so I was basically going through every friend who I knew was comfortable playing games and uh, and doing that. And one of those friends was, uh, was Alan Stone, a friend of mine who I had played mostly just Agricola with at that point. And Alan, uh, we just had a regular play test and he gave some great feedback and he reached out to me a few days later and he said, Jamie, I, I really enjoyed that. I didn't know if I would, but I really enjoyed the process of talking about that, about brainstorming. Um, would, uh, would you be open to me being involved on an ongoing basis? And that was really good for me to hear, really helpful for me to hear. I, I, hadn't, I wasn't looking for a partner, but just the idea that I could have someone who is just as excited as I was about that process that I wouldn't feel guilty about going to, because I felt really kind of guilty going to friends asking for them to play this game that wasn't working very well. Uh, that really helped. And it, 
it uh, helped forge a, a long-term partnership with Alan um, throughout throughout the years. He's still involved. He he doesn't work. He works for uh, like a few hours a week for the company. He, he has another full time job, but he is still very much uh, involved in the process. And how do you distribute that work between the two of you? Like, sort of, what's his wheelhouse versus yours? Yeah, it took us a while to figure that out. I because I, I found fairly early on that uh, exploring that division of duties in in principle was very different than how it would actually work out in practice. So we kind of stumbled through it for a while, and we found that um, that Alan's passion is mainly in playtesting and offering feedback, uh, and he also for a while handled the replacement parts. So if if any of our games. Um, are missing a part or someone tears a card by accident, we, we're happy to, re- to replace it. And that happens quite a bit when you have, we have millions of copies of games out there at this point. So it's only a small percentage, but it adds up to quite a bit. And so he managed that process for a while. And Alan also handles the submission process. So a few years into the company, we started accepting outside submissions from other designers. And uh, Alan sees those submissions and reviews them and decides which ones we want to actually play to see if they are, are viable for, for our company for publishing. So we kind of figured that out along the way, and that, that adds up to typically around maybe five hours a week for him, sometimes more, sometimes a little bit less. Yeah, so that relinquishing control, not not control, but um, accepting the outside submissions, was that a challenge at the beginning, knowing that everything was coming from you? Yeah, it was different, because um, I, I, I didn't really even go into this thinking I was going to start a company. I went into it wanting to put a game on Kickstarter. And I th- realized throughout the Kickstarter process that I was, without realizing it, running a company. That's what happens when you run a Kickstarter campaign. Um, and uh, so for a while, I just thought, okay, I, I guess I'll, I did this Kickstarter. I'll do another one. And I'll, of course, I'll design the game just like the first time around, um, and I'll do that again. But I started to realize that uh, it, as Stillmire Games started to take shape, that um, I have certain design element types of games that I think I'm I'm decent at designing. I at least enjoy designing. And there are certain types of games that I, I'm just not all that good at designing. They're, they're not my forte. But at the time, we thought, okay, we, we want to have a diverse array of games in our portfolio. And so we realized when we came to that realization that we needed to uh, reach out to other people who had talents that were different than mine. So uh, that's when we we uh, found Between Two Cities, which was the first game from another publisher that we published and has grown into a number of different uh, games from other designers including collaborations for expansions. And now our, our best-selling game, Wingspan, was designed by Elizabeth Hargrave and not me. So we are actually, our, our almost our marquee game now was not designed by me. Yeah, and for, um, to start with Viticulture, I actually, I don't know why I was thinking there, would, there was going to be a game before that. It didn't even register that, because Viticulture is a massive hit. It's such a great game. I mean, just like your others, like Scythe and uh, Wingspan and everything. Um, when that, so when you were diving into that, you weren't expecting to start a business necessarily. But right. had you done anything entrepreneurial before um, releasing Viticulture? I had done a, a few little things um, in my twenties. I tried to start a, uh, a, I guess, a web-based app called uh, Type Tribe. The idea being, uh, it was a, basically a feedback platform for writers who wanted to get feedback for their work. I tried to start that. Um, and it didn't really work out at all. I, I had no, I, I had to hire a developer, hire a programmer because I, I don't have those skills and didn't want to take the time to learn those skills and it just didn't work out. And so after that, I did, I was involved in a very small startup for a, uh, an, another, one of my, my, my two passions basically are board games and writing and reading fiction. And so that the other startup after that was a, a, a local independent book publisher, a novel book publisher that I was involved with for, with for a few years. And then I, I found that I was much more passionate about the, the board game company than that company. And so I kind of gave my shares to somebody else and let them run with it. Yeah. Do you write a lot of fiction now? For our games, I write, it's mainly just for our games at this point. It, it's something mm-hmm. I'd like to get back into someday, but uh, I am fully satisfied, I think, in terms of the amount of creative time and energy that I spend on games that, uh, that I... I don't miss it all that much. I think it's it's one of those things that I'm happy to get back into uh, when when maybe someday I get bored of designing games. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean because you are world building, like when you're building exactly. the game. So yeah, yeah it's yeah. it's very very similar, or I'm sure in a sense similar to what you'd be doing otherwise. Yeah. Um, yeah. In terms of 
the so I feel like you are as a company so supportive of your products like to a degree that a lot of other companies aren't they maybe they aren't by choice maybe they aren't because they aren't capable um how did you how did you figure out how much support to give and how do you balance that because you like you said you are open tell us what what's missing what's broken whatever happened and you're very giving in that regard yeah, so the, I guess there's two different elements to, to what you're talking about. One is uh, uh, the focus that we put on our games, and the other is the focus that I put in sharing what I learn and the mistakes that I make and things like that. Uh, for the games themselves, um, there, I guess there are a couple different models for publishing. One is publish a lot of games every year and hope that a few of them work out and become long-term hits. Uh, I don't love that model because... Uh, I'd rather just publish a few games and have those games become hits and, and just focus on what I think is the best work rather than diluting a pretty crowded market with stuff that I, I don't fully believe in. The other model, and I guess maybe the other reason publishers do that is uh, they, re they rely maybe a little bit too heavily on um, single print runs of games, making a print run, put it on Kickstarter maybe, um, and hoping it does well, and then doing it again the next month, the next month, the next month. And... Uh, I would rather put out one or two new games a year, maybe one or two ancillary products, expansions, accessories, things like that, and put the full spotlight on those products to show all the time and resources and energy that we spent putting into those, going into those products and uh, to show that to the world that we really believe in this thing. So much so, like this year, we only have one game coming out this year. And I think that says we believe in this so much that we're not going to put out anything else. This is, this is the thing. This is the thing that we believe in and we, we hope you'll give it a try as well. The other side of that is all the I do create a, a fair amount of content um, on my Stillmeyer Games blog uh, that that is intended to help other creators and entrepreneurs. And I also have a YouTube channel about game design where I talk a lot about games from other designers and other publishers because I I learn from them and I want to share what I learn with others. And I like the conversations that evolve from both of those types of posts. Yeah, it's very valuable to to give back. I mean, because you do we. I mean, we're sort of sampling when, when we're creating, right. when we're moving forward. It's sort of like that concept in music. And this is, right. oh, we love this idea. We love that idea. And it's very helpful. I mean, it's, it's what creates and it's how you can then, then give back to the, to the future. Yeah. Um, so what does a typical day look like for you? Um, running Stonemaier, doing, creating the content, like just across the board, what is a, what does a standard day look like? It's evolved a little bit over time. So if you'd asked me a year ago, um, I was, well, yeah. So a year ago, my schedule was every morning, I focus a lot on communications. I, I get through my, my inbox. I, I hopefully put out any fires. I'm on uh, social media quite a bit. Um, usually there's so, some sort of content I'm creating every day, whether it's a YouTube video or a, uh, a blog post. Um, that's the morning. The afternoon, I often spend kind of wrapping that up and moving into uh, more game development, the game de de development side of things. Not necessarily for my games, usually not for my games, but uh, like uh, taking in playtest reports from from other games and blind playtests we have in process. So a little bit more focused on games specifically. There's still a lot of operations and some marketing that goes into the afternoon. And then in the evening, I usually spent uh, two hours on game design. Um, so it's usually only, in, and those were those are usually the good days. I, I do love to get a few hours of game design in every, every day. It doesn't always happen. That has changed a little bit because I did uh, move in with my girlfriend nine months ago now. And so I like to have my evenings for my personal life. And so my, my personal, my ratio of personal to business time spent has changed a little bit. Um, but so I still have, I still do pretty much the same thing in the mornings. And then I try to fit in more game design time in, uh, in the afternoon and then reserve evenings for, um, for time with Megan. Yeah. And that was a big shift because if I... Yeah. If I read correctly, I mean, you were you were all in on the business for many years. Yeah, I still I still like to think that I'm all in, but now I'm all in with something oh, yeah. else too. So it's it's uh, it, it was maybe a little bit of a challenge, but never one that felt bad. It was more like an interesting puzzle to solve, to, so that I could focus on both and and find ways to to love both of them because uh, both are both are very important to me. Yeah, and I mean that's a great point that that it is it's another puzzle. We're trying to balance yeah. our work, our life, like the work life balance, but also I think that's really indicative of how similar like tabletop board gaming is to entrepreneurship. Yeah. Um oh, yeah. it's we because we are we're 
we're putting out fires, we're solving problems that are presented to us. But in the board game world, it's 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 purely for fun <laughs> and <Right>. competition too. <laughs> but, right. Um, about how much how how much how much time do you tend to spend? from concept through to game creation on your games on my games when i'm designing a game um the the fastest was uh, probably around six months i'm working on one right now that i've worked on for about three years but usually it's around 12 to 18 months from from the initial brainstorming process through the end of uh blind play testing to where i think the game is as as fun and, and balanced and intuitive as possible so yeah, I would say an average between twelve and eighteen months. Uh, sorry, one second. I record the. I do a screen record, and okay. apparently I ran out of hard drive space. But that's hmm. this will be fine now. Are you going to post okay. both audio and video? Yeah, so I do like a okay. an actual a three camera shoot. So okay. um, I'm still figuring out this podcasting thing. So <laughs> so uh, bear with me, but I appreciate you you taking the time to be on. You know. Um, yeah. So I have a camera there, a camera here. So it's sort of like a like sort of over the shoulder interview style. But then I have the yeah. screen record for the actual tight shot on you. So cool. So something I've always been very curious about is like I'm very analytical, data driven. In mm-hmm. those early stages, what how is the balance between pure art and like creativity and maybe data? Because I mean there is just thinking about a lot of these games to to get the balance it there's, it there's a lot of like algorithmic um concepts that are built into to board gaming oh yeah yeah a lot of different value propositions um in, in especially in the types of euro games that i uh, publish and design uh, the the like the cost of things how much how, how much is is one gem worth compared to one gold or one uh the, and the time that you spent getting those things in the game Early on in the process, a lot of it for me is uh, is really not focused on balance. It's focused on just getting the core mechanisms to function and within hopefully within a reasonable time frame also be fun. So there's there's a good block of time where it's just like let's get this to work, and then usually hopefully there's a breakthrough moment where where I have a play test where I'm like oh for the first time that was actually fun. That wasn't just <laughs> we weren't just stumbling through it. That was a fun moment, and then. Um, that's usually when I start to think a lot about more, a lot more about the exact cost of things in, in the game and, and the, 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 the balance between all the different aspects. Uh, and then I go into blind playtesting, which is when I send out prototypes to people around the world. And that's when I really focus on, on the balance. I'm, I'm collecting data at that point, uh, some anecdotal data, but a lot of hard data too, to, to make sure that uh, different asymmetric elements are, are, are balanced, different cards are, don't, uh, aren't uh, objectively or subjectively more or less powerful than other cards if I am trying to balance cards and, and different abilities and things like that. So a lot of it is instinct until I get to that that late playtest and, bl- and blind playtest stage. Yeah. So um, in terms of fun, because you mentioned playing until it's fun, yeah. do you feel like it's possible to take any design and get it to that stage? Or do you have to sort of kill some of them off and go a different route? That's a great, that's a great question. Um, is it possible? Maybe, maybe, but there's definitely, there definitely are quite a few games that I get to, I'm get, I've gotten through a, f- a few prototypes and it has gotten to the stage where it's at least playable. We can play through a whole session and nothing completely breaks. Uh, and I usually ask myself and ask, uh, ask Alan and ask my coworker, Joe, at that point, like, are we really having fun here? Like, is there even the potential for this to be fun? Is it worth spending all the time on this uh, to, to make it fun? Because I think probably we, I could make, or anyone could make any game fun eventually. Uh, but is it is it worth, uh, some games I think are just easier to make fun than others. Um, and there's also the question of, uh, can we make this game innovative and unique and make it stand out from all the other games or all the other products on the market? So how much, I think we can do that for any product, but how much time is it going to take to do that opposed to another game that starts out as innovative and starts out with, with fun elements from the beginning? So then how do you say if you start out with an innovative game, since now we're in the boom, like a renaissance of tabletop gaming, how do you... Yeah. How do you find that that new inspiration to create something that that would be innovative and 
and not and, and just sort of stand out, like you said. It's hard to do because there there are so many fantastic games being published these days, and uh, I'm excited by that. I, I love I love that. I think uh, every designer is essentially pushing every other designer to be to innovate and do something special that stands out. And so, uh, it really, for I mean, for every idea that I have that I think is unique, there's probably a bunch of other adjacent ideas that already exist to a certain extent. And it's throughout the playtesting process that I that I identify the fun elements, and I'm I really I'm constantly questioning them. Even as I come up with a fun element, I have to look at that element and say, "But does this exist better in another game already? Um, and if so, should I just yield to that game and be happy that it already exists, or should I spend more time on this, making it more unique and more fun, so it does stand out in comparison to that other game?" So it really evolves throughout that playtesting process. Uh, and sometimes it gets to the point where I'm like, you know, this, it just isn't better than a, than a game that a very similar game that already exists. Why not just play that game rather than spend the next 10 months trying to make this one work? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that is, I mean, figuring out the next product for any sort of business is a big challenge. And yeah. you're running through, through play tests. You're doing everything to get the game just right. Do you have any way of measuring how likely you think a game's going to be a hit and actually become profitable. I wish there were a magic formula to figure that out. <laughs> um, not just for figuring out which games that we proceed with, but also figuring out, for example, how many games, how many units to make in the first print run, which it continues to be a, an ongoing puzzle. And to ex- illustrate this, you probably know this from reading what I've written, but your listeners may not know this, but in the game industry, um, uh, unless you run a Kickstarter campaign, it is a complete guess as to how many games you need to make on any given print run. Because typically, like if I make 10,000 copies of a game, I don't hear from distributors. I'm selling most of those games to distributors. I don't hear how many copies of the game they want until the games are already in stock. Um, they are not telling me, Jamie, I hope that you make this, I hope you make 5,000 copies of the game for me before I even start the print run. So it is a complete guessing game for for distributors and for how many that will sell directly to consumers. So I, I wish there was a magic formula to it. A, a lot of it has come down to my awareness of other games on the market and how they do, and my awareness of, of our audience and our historical numbers for, for games that we published. And how has it been when those numbers don't jive? Because you've been in both directions, I know, like maybe yeah. too high of a print and too low of a print. Um, how, does, how does that sort of, what's the internal strife that you deal with with that? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, so the two examples that I think you might be referring to a little bit are there was a game that we published called Between Two Castles of Mad King Ludwig. And it was a game that I was fully confident would be both a short term and a long term hit. And so I made 20,000 copies in the first print run. Um, and this was back in this is almost two years ago now. And we are still selling through those 20,000 copies. It's still a game that I very much believe in. I still send it to reviewers. I still think it could reach that critical mass where we have future more print runs and whatnot, but it did not take off like I thought it would. And then we had another game. We had Wingspan, which I mentioned is now our best-selling game. Wingspan was a game that I even talked to distributors about it in advance. I, I ran it by a few distributors. I said that we have this really great engine building game with a bird theme, a theme that I was, a, while I while I loved it in the game, I was worried if hobby gamers were even going to give it a try in the first place. And so the all, all the data I gathered showed that we probably needed a first print run of about around 10,000 copies, and then hopefully we'd make another print run. But the buzz around that game was huge out of the gate. Uh, early reviews were, were great. There was a lot of buzz about it, and uh, 10,000 was far too few copies, I think, for us to make. But by the time we knew that, we have a, a lead time of another five months to make the next print run. So, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It goes both and, ways. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, with that upfront expenditure then too, I mean, that obviously plays plays a major role. Yeah. How how long, so without doing Kickstarter the first time, do you yeah. see a path for someone else that might be doing, trying to, to launch a game? I mean, Kickstarter is the, it's sort of the, the holy grail of gaming, it feels like at the moment. But I know yeah. now that you have a lot more experience, you're not so keen on Kickstarter necessarily. Yeah, I, I, I am forever grateful for the Kickstarter platform as a creator. My company wouldn't exist without it, and it wouldn't have grown without it. 
Um, but we did step away from it after our uh, the Scythe campaign in 2015 uh, because I realized, for a variety of reasons, but it really comes down to this, I, I realized that I um, we had the resources to just make products that we really believed in. And I instead of having a six to eight month gap between when people gave us money for those products and us delivering those products to them, we could just make it, announce it, share what it is, and then a few weeks later, uh, start shipping the game to people, really tightening and closing that gap between announcement and and when you get it at your front door um, or even when retailers get it. So I love closing that gap. Uh, for a new creator, though, that's, your question started out with, for a new creator, what what would they do? What should they do? It's totally up to them. I, I think many people are just want to design games, for example, in the game industry. They just want to design games, and that's an opportunity to, send, to sell games to publishers rather than trying to run a business around it. But if I were just starting out today, I would absolutely still start out with a Kickstarter campaign because the mm-hmm. the stakes are much lower, I think, if you don't fund. You've invested money in art and graphic design a little bit, but you haven't ruined yourself financially, hopefully, just to just to find out that no one wants your product. Um, so I think that's a nice safety net and it's a great way to, to market and build a community if you don't already have one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and that is a thing. You lay the groundwork and hopefully other people too who are doing the same thing is invest heavily in the play testing, the development of the game itself. I mean, that yeah. that's everything. It's the Kickstarter. Yeah. You can only really do well with any sort of product if it's, if it's solid and a great game. Um, yeah. So this industry isn't all that cash flow positive generally. How yeah. have you found, what ways have you found to sort of manage that? Yeah, it's an interesting puzzle. Another, another <laughs> interesting gaming puzzle almost to figure out. Um, I, so we, we've, the, the, I've had a few different experiences with it. One, what run, for those first years running Kickstarter campaigns, great profit margins on a Kickstarter campaign because you're charging people, a, 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 maybe not full MSRP, but a, a, a decent amount over the cost of making and shipping the game. Profit margins are great. For about a year after I stopped using Kickstarter, I shifted to purely selling games to distributors. And in the board game industry, distributors buy products at a 60% discount off MSRP. It is possible to make a profit on that, but it is a lot more difficult. Uh, if a game costs $10 to make, to manufacture, usually the MSRP is around $50 and a distributor is buying it for $20. And so I have maybe roughly a $10 profit on that if I don't actually make any more copies of it. But if, if I then reinvest that 10, those $10 in a second print run of the game, I, technically I'm making a profit, but really I'm just m- trying to create a long tail for that game. And so I kind of realized over the last few years that I needed to have a better balance. I needed to not just rely on, on direct sales like Kickstarter, and I also need to not just rely on distributors, I needed a balance of both. And so at this point, we do a little bit of both. I would say maybe 15% of our sales, maybe 20, uh, I would say around 15% are direct to customer. Another uh, 10 to maybe 15% of our revenue is uh, licensed deals with localization partners around the world, people who, publishers who publish our games in other languages. And then the other maybe 60% or so, um, if I did that math right, what 60, 70% is to distributors and retailers. Oh, yeah. So, and part of your direct sales involves a membership. How yes, yeah. how did you come to that and how does that work? I basically did something that uh, I think your listeners might think is pretty dumb, but I basically wanted to compete with Amazon a little bit. Uh, Amazon, I think, has an amazing Prime program where I, I'm, a, I'm an Amazon Prime member and I love the idea that I don't have to think about shipping when I shop on Amazon. I can just click a button and don't have to worry about shipping. And so I kind of wanted to compete against that idea a little bit and encourage customers, give people a reason um, to feel good about purchasing directly from us and not think about the shipping cost. And so, and this is part of it. The other part is uh, I had another, a number of people had asked, how can I support the, uh, the written content and the video content t- content that you create? And I debated things like Patreon and, and, and drip and things like that. But I basically came up with a program called the Stillmeyer champion program where people can pay currently it's fifteen dollars. Originally it was twelve dollars for a year subscription, essentially, where they support the content we create. And as a perk to those people, they get uh, priority shipping, and they get either fr- free or discounted shipping depending on where in the world they they live. 
And it's uh, currently, I think we have around 6,500 Stonemaier champions. So nowhere near the number of Amazon Prime subscribers, but it's great to know that whenever I release a new product, there are 6,500 people who are at least somewhat interested in, in buying that product and buy products from, a, from us directly on an ongoing basis. Yeah, I think that's a great example of how to, like, you're not only asking people, hey, what do you think? Do you want to buy something? And like, oh, we have these so many people on the email newsletter, but they've actually put money down. They've they've opened yeah. their wallet. And that's, that is the key to figuring out if a product's going to be viable. And mm -hmm. they've opened their wallet, not for just a product, but to support you because yeah, they really, they really appreciate what you're doing. And like, you do phenomenal stuff. And how much content do you end up producing? Because you do quite a bit through through the various videos and written stuff. Yeah, the, the pattern I'm currently on, I, I write two Stonemaier Games blog posts a week. And so by Stonemaier, those are games on the Stonemaier Games website that focus on entrepreneurs and, and crowdfunding and, and business. Um, I post two short videos a week about each one about a specific game and then a longer video every Sunday about uh, usually it's like a top 10 list or something that dives deep into a specific area of game design. I do one Instagram post a day, usually about games, sometimes about cats. Um, <laughs> and uh, I also have a personal blog that I've maintained for around 13 years now where I just write about oh, wow. stuff I'm excited about, a, a book, a, a restaurant, a movie that I'm excited about. That's kind of just a fun little outlet. I think that's it. Yeah, I think that's all the regular content I produce. Oh, and I have a Facebook Live show every every uh, Wednesday where I mainly just interact directly with fans and answer questions and talk about what we're doing at Stonemaier Games. So I know we, we sort of talked about your day and everything already, but how do you possibly manage all of that? <laughs> it's so much content and like everything that goes into running the business like you talked about and designing the games. I mean, it feels like it has to be, you have to be going, going, going. That I mean, yeah. During the during my work day, I I uh, I generally stay pretty focused uh, on, on those different tasks. They take different amounts of time. Like the, the blog entries usually take around an hour, and then I'm usually answering questions throughout the week, or, or at least commenting. Depends on the blog post too. Some get fewer comments than others for another thirty minutes, maybe an hour. Um, the YouTube videos. I this is one thing I've realized about the YouTube videos. I basically decided early on that the style of video I wanted to shoot was short and unedited. Um, I wanted to just sit in front of a camera and talk for a few minutes, which has probably limited the number of people who care about the videos at all because they're just staring at my face for five minutes talking to them about a game and they're not even seeing any visuals. Unless Sometimes I like hold up photos of the game I'm talking about or if I own the game, I'll hold up the actual game. Uh, but I basically decided I don't want to spend more than five or ten minutes on these, these shorter videos. Uh, and I'll just see where it takes me because my enjoyment from them is just talking about the game and then interacting with people as we talk about the game later. We have evolved that a little bit for the longer videos where I film the longer videos and I send them to Joe and Joe adds pictures and lists and things on the screen. But it was really me deciding this is how much time I want to spend on this and how much time I can spend on it if I want to sustain this and, and sticking with that. Um, like how much for, for your shows, how much time do you spend throughout the process for any given podcast episode? Because I bet there's a lot of editing and things that go in beyond the, the 30 minutes we're going to chat. Oh, yeah. It's so much more time than just this conversation, especially having the multiple cameras. I have to first I process the audio, then I go through, move it over to Final Cut, do all the camera cuts. It's 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 quite a bit of work. <laughs> that's a lot. Um, yeah. yeah, that's why I'm sort of in awe of how much you do. Um, is there, do you think that you'd be able to maintain what you're doing without so much content? Do you think there's sort of a line of hmm. um, diminishing returns, maybe? I have wondered that. Like if, if, if one day if I stopped filming YouTube videos, if I stopped uh, writing the blog, what would happen? I don't know if anything disastrous would happen. I, I, think, uh, I think I could continue to, to run Stomar Games just fine. I'd probably have a little bit more time for game design. Um, but because those do create such great platforms for me to connect with people and also process my own thoughts, I think there is an inherent value to, uh, to them. Even if I was actually, even if I was just writing the video, making the videos and writing the content and not even sharing it with people, I would still have value in it. Uh, just cause I, I, that's how I process things to, by, by talking about it or by writing about it. Um, there would probably be, I, I think you're right. There is a diminishing return to it at a, at a certain point. If I was trying to write a blog post every day or film a video every day, 
I don't think that would be a good balance, but I, I think I found a pretty good balance um, to it. And I'll continue yeah. to ask that question. Is, is this a good balance? Is this good for the company? Is it good for me personally? Yeah. And, and sort of on that note, how do you reflect on different things in, throughout the company of where your attention is and maybe when you might need another employee or do you have any sort of system for figuring that out? I think there are a couple of different microsystems. Like one is the actual act of writing the blog and and writing the uh, and filming the videos. The blog in particular, because the blog, I look at specific elements of business business, and whenever I do, I often end up being a little bit introspective about it. I, I mean, maybe I see another company doing something awesome, and I ask myself, should we be doing that? Are we doing that? Can we do that better? Um, we also have a group of shareholders. Uh, so, so our Games is an S corp, and so we have a certain number of shares in the company. And uh, every month, I, I have an ongoing conversation with those shareholders, but I also post an update every month, and that's a good time for me to reflect on what we're doing and to get feedback from our shareholders about how we're doing. And then there's also um, my my weekly meetings with Joe and Alan, which a process that's changed during the pandemic. Unfortunately, we don't have as many of those meetings, but we. Before the pandemic, we met once a week to either play test. And whenever we weren't play testing, we would go out for lunch and just talk about the company and talk about things. And so that was kind of a good time to reflect on the balance and and the company and what we were doing that we wanted to continue or to do better or to do less of. Yeah. And you, I mean, it feels like you have even like a little family there, like your yeah. business is, it's your extended family. And yeah. that is, it's so valuable to uh, sort of the... The adage is no one will be as invested in your company as you are. But the more you bring people in, which like I think you do phenomenally well, like through it sounds like through your business, but also with the community, you're really bringing everyone together. And I think it's, I think you're a great example, no matter the industry someone's in. Um, I think you're a great example to to look towards and follow. I also like how you don't just talk. I say just, but you're not only talking about board gaming. I mean, you are. You're, you've rounded out the picture of who Jamie is, which is very valuable. So I think it's easy to get caught up in like, this is me. I've found this lane and mm. I can't diverge from there. So yeah, I'm hoping people really enjoy this episode and dive in to follow you. Um, one last question. Yeah. What is the one thing that you wish in retrospect that you knew when you started? Oh, uh, that's a big question. There is no just one thing. You know that. There's, there's more than just one. But what is what is one thing that I wish I knew? Hmm. Give me a give me a second to think about that. Hopefully we can oh, yeah, around for sure. this. Um what is one big thing that I wish I knew about the business in general? Um okay. W- one thing that I wish I had known, among many things that I wish I had known, uh was and we kind of touched upon it a little, a little bit earlier. This is why this has come to mind is uh, the, the idea that um, uh, sweat equity, it can be very different than the amount of financial equity that I or other people invest in a company. Uh, one of one early mistake that we made that we worked around, I, I worked around it. We, we found our way out of it, but uh, I, Early, very early on in the company, uh, me and 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 Alan and, and one other person, both uh, all three of us, invested a small amount of company to pay for some of the original art and graphic design to build the company. And because we each put in the same amount of money, we decided, okay, we'll each own a third of the company. And there were discussions about uh, at the time about um, what we would each be doing uh, with our time, so that we would each be spending uh, an equal amount of time on the company doing different things as well, but. That was very theoretical. We didn't really know how it would work out. And so I kind of wish, in in hindsight, I I very much wish that that we had actually just tried to run the company together for a little while before deciding what those ownership percentages were instead of just basing it on the finances. Because what actually happened, similar to what we talked about earlier, and this wasn't a conflict with Alan, it was a bit of a conflict with a third party, was that I was mostly running the company. Alan was doing a few things. And the other partner, who I'm very grateful for, for their financial investment, Mm -hmm. but that they weren't doing anything else. And so uh, I wish we had, uh, we, we had figured that out and, and actually just worked together for a while before deciding how to split up the company. And so for anyone looking for partners in a company, um, I, uh, maybe learn from my mistake there and, and do a little differently. I, I would definitely have, have done that differently if I could do it again. 
Yeah, I mean that's great advice. Find, I mean, finding a partner is is very challenging. So, yeah, um, yeah. but also vital. I mean, we do. It's hard to work in a vacuum. We just we can't. We yeah. can't really succeed. We succeed together. That's really how it yeah. goes. Um, yeah. So, thank you so much for doing this. I think this is a great conversation. I think people are going to get a lot out of it. Where should we send people to follow you, follow the company, and check out some of your games? Yeah, all of all of the content that I produce, both on the game side and all these videos and blog posts I've been talking about, are on can be found on StoneMeyerGames.com. Um, all of it's kind of aggregated there. Yeah, perfect. Well, yeah, yeah. So thank you again for taking the time. I don't want yeah. to cut into too much of your day, and really appreciate you. And we will talk again sometime soon, hopefully. Sounds great. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you, Jeff. See ya. I can't thank Jamie enough for being on the show. It was a great conversation. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, be sure to go to his website, stonemeyergames.com, and follow him on all the socials. And if you are if you weren't already familiar with the booming tabletop and board game hobby, uh, do yourself a favor and check it out. He has some of my all-time favorite games, like I mentioned up at the top. I mean, three of the most popular games of all time in Scythe viticulture and wingspan and you you just can't go wrong he's a great person does great work and definitely worth supporting so be sure to check him out at stonemeyergames.com as always this episode of starting now is brought to you by built at built we help you get started online whether you're starting a blog starting a business or whatever you're trying to get off the ground so head on over to built.co that's b-y-l-t dot c-o to get started built your website built for you simply Finally, if you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe to Apple Pod... Subscribe to? Subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Also, be sure to check out the video version of the show on YouTube. I actually really liked the YouTube version version of this show. It's been fun to create it in a more over-the-shoulder, like, proper interview style. So I'd love it if you checked it out and let me know what you think. Well, that'll do it for another week. Again, I am Jeff Saris. This is Starting Now, and I'll see you next time.